today, Ian Wright, um, who is speaking to us from Tuscany at the moment, which is wonderful. Um, and we were just chatting recently about uh, Ian's books, which uh, he's written around what, uh, one on anxiety or healing anxiety, uh, another one on the dynamics of stillness and another one coming up um, about uh, the practitioner's journey to wholeness, um, which I'd be love, love to see that. So those of you who don't know Ian, um, he's been practicing uh, cranial and particularly pediatric osteopathy for well over 30 years now and lectures internationally all over the world. Um, and he has a lot of experience about the subject he's going to be talking about uh, today, which is around uh, concussion. So uh, Ian's going to speak for a while and then we'll open up for questions. Um, and uh, so please come forward with those and just put them in the chat. That'd be wonderful. So welcome, Ian. Thank you for being here. It's lovely to, to see be you. Here. Good to be here. Great. <laughs> Stop me if I go on for too long. <laughs> uh, that's fine. We've got about an hour. So. Okay. Well, should be, cool. should be able to cover it, hopefully, in that. Wonderful. So, yes, it's an it's an interesting, I suppose, as a, an introduction to it, it's a particularly interesting area of work. And here I'm going to talk about practitioners of craniosacral therapy and cranial osteopathy, okay, because there's there's obviously enough similarities in, the, in those two in terms of their potential to have effect. Um, and I'm not going to go into which blend of cranial osteopathy and which blend of, of um, craniosacral therapy. It doesn't matter because um, I've taught all of them and I've experienced in all of that side of things. Um, so that's to start with. It, this the, the reason why I suppose it's so important is that there really aren't that many tools that we have that people have for managing concussion or post-concussion syndrome there's four different things here there's concussion there's post-concussion syndrome which is a mild form of traumatic brain injury and then we have the idea of chronic traumatic encephalopathy right which is i'll talk about each of those in turn and how they all interconnect and yeah where we can get to it so concussion the first term, um, this was first mentioned these kind of terms a long time ago. This has been in medicine a long time ago, um, in fact, for almost for a thousand years. And the, it comes from the Latin word concussus, which is the perfect tense of con concutio, meaning to shake violently. OK, now it's classified as a mild traumatic brain injury. But the thing with it is that it doesn't show any damage on a normal CT scan. So it's a traumatic brain injury where you can't actually see evidence of it. So post-concussion syndrome, which is now termed long concussion after the whole long COVID thing, is when symptoms of mild concussion persist longer than expected, and they can accumulate it with repeated head trauma. The accumulation is a really important thing which we'll talk about. So what are the symptoms of acute concussion? Okay, normally, and they can be other things, there's a headache, a sense of pressure in the head. You can have nausea and vomiting. You can have sound and or light sensitivity. You can feel sluggish and groggy. You can get a bit of brain fog. You can feel a bit emotionally low or anxious, okay? Or you can get more severe effects, like for example, a seizure, okay? So most of these concussion symptoms will resolve over seven to 14 days. Okay, that's really important. So persistent post-concussive symptoms are symptoms that last over two weeks, over 14 days. And they can include headaches, a sense of irritability and anxiety, a sense of anxiety, sleep issues, meaning you can't get to sleep or that you're always feeling sleepy, a loss of concentration, memory, ringing in the ears, blurry vision. You can have noise and or light sensitivity. And in certain cases, which I'll talk about, you can get a sense of loss in smell and taste. Quite commonly, 
feelings of depression and you can have gastric and occasionally cardiac symptoms, heart symptoms, which we'll talk about later with regards to the vagal nerve. Now, <clears throat> a word about children, because I do kind of specialize in pediatrics. Often children, you don't know they've hit their head because you can't watch them all day. And especially young toddler children, if they take a fall, they're crying. You don't know why they're crying. They can't effectively communicate it. So you don't know necessarily if they've actually um, hurt the, uh, banged their heads what you need to see, which is a pretty, when I was thinking about this, it's a pretty obvious thing actually. Because, but if the, if a child is vomiting, if they're listless, if they, you know, if they they not showing clear consciousness and they or they can't stand properly, um, and if they're vomiting, that's a sign to take them to hospital. But actually, that's a sign to take a child to hospital anyway. That's a kind of red flag, anyways. So you don't know what it's what it's from. Um, it's interesting that more women than men suffer the effects of concussion and post-concussion syndrome, um, which is kind of interesting because it, probably more men get head injuries. So there is one hypothesis which is going around about it, which is if a woman receives a head blow in the last two weeks of their cycle, it can affect the HP, uh, oh, the, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian function leading to less progestion, progesterone uh, production in the ovaries, adrenals, which can create an increased sense of withdrawal in them. And that could accentuate sensations of pain and nausea and dizziness, which may, may be interesting. I'll talk about that later. So how is, how is um, concussion diagnosed? Okay, so you've got these... Uh, assessment tools, head injury assessment tools. This is the one, this is the one that um, is used by uh, World Rugby actually. And they go through, it's quite interesting. You go through a series of questions and you rate the, this, this person and then you'll be able to tell. And I'm gonna go through them because it's actually is one, some of them are quite interesting. So that you ask the, the you ask the, um, the person who's who's received a head trauma, what venue are we at today? Which half are you in? Let's say they're playing a match. Um, who scored last? What team did you play last week? You know, these are always things. When did your time when did a team last win? <laughs> if they can remember that. And then they then you have to uh, test your memory. So they give you some options like so so the, so the person assessing them and that they don't need to be a doctor can say elbow, apple, carpet, saddle, bubble, say. Or there's a various options. And you have to remember that and say it back to them. Okay. And then sequences of numbers. Okay. And then there are certain things. You can watch them standing to see if their balance is normal. And you can provoke that to see if they can hold a gait with two legs. And then you ask them for the usual symptoms. Headache, dizziness, pressure in the head, nauseated, blurred vision, um, light or sound. Do you feel as like you're slowing down? Do you feel like you're in a fog? Do you feel unwell? Okay. Any emotional symptoms? And so the, then you get graded. And if they have a certain grade of things, you know, bang, you'll be taken off, whatever. So that's how it's done. Now that is overridden if there is a doctor there who will do a, a, a neurological screen, say simple kind of pupil response reflexes, et cetera, et cetera. So that medical evaluation um, is important part of it. So, so concussion involves multi potentially multi faceted neurological, mental status, vision, gait, balance, sleep wake cycles. Um, evaluation if it is, if you have some sort of traumatic brain injury, is MRI, CT scans. Okay. But it's not. The point about this is it's not completely reliable as a tool, but even if you take MRIs and CTs, because a lot of the kind of pathophysiology of it is unseen at that level, and it's more on a cellular level. So, but also the a, a very big issue is you can have an absolutely normal um, CT MRI. Um, you can have no symptomology at all. So the brain feels, seems like it's fine. 
And they've taken their two weeks off, say, I think it's normally about two weeks for jockey. It's about that kind of time if you've had an injury, seven days, 14 days after the last symptom, it depends. Um, and But they don't, these measures don't reflect the, the process of physiological brain restoration, right? And so it's widely considered by researchers, and certainly by, by me, that the brain is slower to recover than the symptoms show, okay? And mo- recent studies with neuroimager imaging reflect this as, as, as clearly the case. So there are some, like the pathophysiology of it is there are some changes when you've had trauma to the head. I'll talk about the types of, of, of tra- traumas as well, as well um, in a minute, but you can have um, direct changes in the, in the glucose metabolism in the neurons you can get very small vascular damage around in the areas that are certainly around the cortex and you can have inflammatory changes what happens when there's a big jolt at a cellular level potassium flows out of, of the neuron and calcium and sodium flow in which creates a widespread neuronal depression and it affects the mitochondria which are the kind of powerhouses in the neuron so you get these large or small areas of micro damage. You also get poor cerebrospinal fluid fluctuation, of which it's very, we'll talk about a lot later. So what happens on a micro level, and they're just starting to see this, is the neuronal micro architecture, which is the connective tissue within the cells, which is thought to be very important in um neuronal communication, because there are there is these, I'm, I'm going to go a bit, a bit off track here, but basically the brain is seeming in some of the modern um, field theories of, of brain function. And, and I, I teach courses on neurodiversity where I go into this quite a lot, um, that it's not just synaptic exchange, neuronal function, that it's too slow. The brain works much quicker than that. And so some of these modern f- theories of field function and even quantum field function uh, uh, make more sense as different modes of of brain function. And so a lot of that is is engaged with some of the connective tissue function. Okay, so the microarchitecture within the neurons is seemingly very important. Um, So this is important also in in children who've had traumatic brain injury. Okay, so because some of the long tracks, certainly in the first year, are not myelinated, they're not, they're not haven't got their covering, they're less protect, pro- protected. So actually head injury in a young child could actually lead to more damage than we want, okay? So there are three types commonly known, actually, um, of concussion we're talking about here, okay? There is direct impact, so you hit something directly, you bash it, bang okay that's direct impact the actual direct physical force is affecting uh, directly affects the brain okay the brain is well protected for this which i'll talk about in a minute you have acceleration deceleration brain injury so the brain gets shifted in the container okay so that's actually the problem is the movement the jolt right and the jolt can be say for the classic maybe is from a road traffic accident where you put your hands on the steering wheel and the seatbelt and your head is thrown forwards and backwards. So there's a very rapid acceleration, deceleration. You're not hitting the head directly, but it's the movement of the brain, which is quite heavy inside that causes a lot of micro damage, okay? But that can also be being hit by a rugby tackle, okay? Or a fall, and the fall can be on quite commonly, the fall can be on your butt, on your sacrum, okay? And that creates a very precise and particular pattern in, in um, as well as a, 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 t- a certain type of conscious uh, um, concussion. So the, 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 fine, the, the, the final type is a blast injury, which is near, if you're near an explosion, right? And this can cause multiple diffuse brain pathologies. Now that isn't just a blast because I was treating this guy in hospital who actually had these multifocal diffuse brain pathologies and he had been in a very severe road traffic accident and where the person with him 
um, lost their life, and he was in a coma when we started. Um, anyway, that's that's a that's an interesting one. Come back to that maybe. So there are three grades of concussion. Okay, grade one, no loss of consciousness, right? No loss of memory or loss of memory for less than 30 minutes. Okay, grade two is a loss of consciousness for less than five minutes and amnesia for 30 minutes to 24 hours, okay? So now the grade three is a loss of consciousness for more than five minutes or amnesia or and or amnesia for more than 24 hours, okay? So medical, the classic medical intervention in this. So it's mainly screening, yeah, especially for, especially if they've had a loss of consciousness, they wanna screen and see if anything comes up, especially things like shaking, seizures, repeated vomiting, especially as I said, in children. Um, They'll give paracetamol for pain types because you don't use um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories because that could potentially cause a bleed to the site of the injury, which is kind of an important thing to remember. Sleep is the biggest healer um, because it's vital because the brain has a chance to detoxify and heal and has certain movements of the uh, cerebrospinal fluid in sleep, which we'll talk about if we have time later, which helps the brain go through its healing process, okay? And lots of fluids. And the important thing is not to return to sport too quickly. So you have to be carefully monitored time-wise, um, in, especially for like, I, my, my main practice is in Ireland and there's a lot of rugby players and there's a lot of jockeys. And my goodness, do they get injuries. <laughs> Amazing, yeah? Um, so they're not allowed, obviously, con obviously, you say, contact sport until they're symptom-free. First question, of course, is, is that enough time? Is that enough time to actually, for the brain to properly heal, okay? I don't think so. And I think that that's where the risks come. What I see in practice is a cumulative traumatic brain injury and this is really important because and there's there's a sport called hurling hurling it's called in ireland where you have the sticks and it's it's pretty violent you know they wear helmets so the, some of them do not all of the guys but the sticks are high and you're trying to get the ball in the air and you're you're likely to get a hurley round the head quite a lot okay um and these guys, and like I was treating of quite a famous jockey just last week, actually, I treated quite a lot of different concussion things in my last week in practice, um, who'd been run over by a horse, like very severe injury, actually. Um, and, um, you know, huge impact. So what can happen, though, when, if you're looking at rugby players or you're looking at um, other sports people in contact, sports boxers, for, you know, I mean, it's direct, isn't it? So is they can accumulate. So you have an injury, say a direct impact injury here, you have more of a whiplash type injury, which has a slightly different effect on, on, on the system. And there are consequences that you can detect, pick up, and no, you, you know, which cannot be picked up because they're functional changes as opposed to, well, they are, the thing is, they're microstructural changes, which aren't picked up, right, on CT, MRI, but that you can feel them. And that's where, as we come on to this, the great opportunity for this kind of work is, is actually we can detect, you know, so often you put your hands on, you go, what have you done to your head? You can see, feel a direct impact here. It's very clear. And they'll say, and interestingly enough, they go, oh, nothing. And then they'll go, oh, actually, actually I, you know, I got a hurley around the head last week. You know, I forgot about it. Classic, you know, boys, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, I did, you know fall or whatever but but what happens is you you start to build up and not recover from these multiple strain patterns and then the micro damage accumulates and this boy I was I was helping one of my associates out last week who was we were treating who he had three or four concussions and then suddenly bang constant headache constant night and day right his dural membrane the whole dural globe had, had locked down right and it was the accumulation you get to a tipping point where things just create trouble okay so 
another thing, if you're talking at more different types of brain, it's say so you've got an ischemic brain injury, which we treat a lot of uh, with, with with babies or in, in adults with who've had strokes, you have the mast cells and mast, I'm very into mast cells because I just gave a, a course on, on immune system last week. Um, but they live inside the meninges, the coverings of the brain, right? And they are protective. From, so the problem actually is they actually, they live in within the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid has a wonderful, uh, um, it actually has its own biome as well, but it, ha- but it has a lot of immune cells in it in the brain. And the problem with mast cells is they can be quite over responsive responsive and they and if you if you get quite a lot of mast cells releasing their histamine into the area they can cause a rapid vasodilation and potential hemorrhage okay because and they can act what they can act is they 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 can act to degrade the vascular endothelium the inner the beautiful inner inner lining of the micro vessels right which are on the outside of the brain and certainly some way in and that's true of very of more bigger but uh brain trauma but it's also true why why i'm saying that is it's also true on a very micro level okay and some of the microvasculature is a hugely important that surrounds the brain so what is cro- chronic traumatic encephalopathy right as i said traumatic brain injuries accumulate damage especially true if you're if you're playing say rugby you know and the you know the rugby the the power in the hits in rugby these days is phenomenal. I mean, it's crazy, you know, and obviously in boxing, the idea of being punch drunk is exactly that, you know, soccer, even heading the ball, you know, all of these are very important things. And it's really very much in the press now. Um, last year, for example, um, some re- researchers in Boston scanned 376 former NFL uh, American football players and found 345 of the 376 had evidence of chronic chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Okay, so in CTE, I'm going to call it for for speed, there is a cascade of pathophysiology. So the damaged cells release glutamate, which acts to flood um, calcium into into neurons which creates damage then the, as i said the mitochondria get damaged and then you get this neuroinflammation and apoptosis cell death um there are there are particular areas of the brain which are prone any there's a lot of areas that can be prone to damage but there's particular areas that i'll talk about specifically because they're quite i find them quite interesting number one is and at the front, the prefrontal cortex, okay, that gets a lot of direct head trauma, okay? But it can also have the effects of a whiplash type concussion pattern because it's going to hit the front. The, the, it's, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex sits on the cisterna, these water beds of the brain, right? But actually that, and that protects it. The, the brain is incredibly, um, it has a, a wonderful protective system, which is the bathing of the whole cerebrospinal fluid, right? The whole brain is surrounded through the subarachnoid space with cerebrospinal fluid. So it's like a tadpole that's floating, okay? And it has this lovely floatiness, which makes it, what is it, about fifth or no, maybe even less of its actual weight because the fluid system holds it in space. It's got this extremely strong, resilient dural membrane, which protects the brain as well from direct trauma. The problem with the dural membrane is often in these concussive uh, situations is it gets locked down and you can fit it in, in particular areas and often even globally. The whole thing has a degree of motility and ability to move within itself, which just gets blocked and shut down. Okay. Now, what is... The, pro- the, the important thing, okay, with the prefrontal cortex is one of its, its, its executive function of the brain. For example, things like impulse control. So if you have an impulse to do it, to do something, the brain, the, co- the prefrontal cortex comes in and says, no, you're not going to get angry at ja, 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 that's triggered me. Yeah, you're going to be, uh, you know, an adult and you're just going to, whatever. Now, if your impulse control is damaged, it can lead to problems, you know, and you can get them in certain types of 
um, ADHDs and certain type of things uh, in in certain children and teenagers, of course, have difficulties with that because the whole prefrontal cortex rewires itself when you're a teenager, another subject. But so it, there has been links actually with these NFL players being more likely to end up in jail, more likely to, to become violent criminals. Um, and they're linking it up to with a tendency to violence, okay? So how many folks, for example, in prison have chronic tra traumatic encephalitis? Question. So an another, I'll just talk about another two areas. Um, what covers some of the cranial bones, uh, sorry, the, some of the cranial nerves, okay? I'll just talk about two. Um, a classic one is if, when you have this brain whiplash, yeah? Um, when you, especially with the jolting forwards and backwards of the brain, what it can do is it can tear some of the olfactory nerve, the, the nerve, that's the first cranial nerve, the nerve of sense of smell. It can tear off the filaments that pass through the cribriform plate and into the frontal, and because it, it goes up into the frontal the cortex, underneath the frontal cortex is where the, the ganglia of the olfactory nerve is. So that you lose the connection between, in that olfactory tract, you lose your sense of smell. And through that, you lose a lot of your sense of taste because the sense of smell is important in, in the makeup of the sense of taste. So that, that I've treated that quite a lot where people with whiplash have lost their sense of smell uh, and taste. Um, the, another thing is what happens is when the dural membrane can get locked down, there can be quite a lot of compression at the between the head and the neck, okay? And it can lock up parts of the occipital suture, the tentorum, the whole dural men membrane can get shut down at the back and it can affect function of say the vagal nerve with all of its consequences and it and affects all the different systems. Um, the, the adrenals don't have any direct vagal uh, supply, everything else does. I mean, and it has a whole effect on the whole vas vascular system. So it's good. It's a huge ramifications. And that's why often the, the, the vagus is implicated when you're sick as well. It doesn't, it could be set the vomiting centers, but it, the vagus is often implicated when someone has more of a kind of chronic uh, nausea after a concussion. Now, another one, which is important, and you could mention more, but is the, the the function of the hippocampus, okay, and some of the areas locally around that part of parts of the limbic system, and there it, this is this is again this is a personal view, okay. So I'm not you know it's just an, uh, something that I've witnessed. So I'm just going to say it as that. It's, this is not evidenced except for by my sensations and, and people who work in this way. Is the the hippocampus lies below the, the inferior pole of the lateral ventricle, okay? The ventricular system of the brain is very important container of the cerebrospinal fluid, okay? Cerebrospinal fluid is very important in the process of detoxification of the brain, and it's shown increasingly some of the... the, the uh, the modern research about how the cerebrospinal fluid programs the brain is very, very interesting. Have to look that up. Um, so there seems to be a lack of fluid fluctuation in the lateral ventricle. I mean, the lateral ventricles have these wonderful choroid processes, uh, choroid, um, not processes, that, that produce cerebrospinal fluid, okay? So they're making cerebrospinal fluid at like, I think it's 50 milliliters a day, right? They're making the, these, and, and a lot of the, they're in the third ventricle as well. Um, and they create this fluctuation of this, this movement of the cerebrospinal fluid by creating quite a lot of it, okay? And if everything's shut down in that area from traumatic, a traumatic brain injury, okay, it can lead you to memory processing issues, okay? And it can eventually lead to cognitive decline, which is a, a huge area of interest for me, um, clinically working with people and the functional of ventricles in relationship to cognitive decline is a, is a very, 
I think, potentially exciting area for this kind of work again. Um, so what are the, what's the normal treatment for um, post-concussive or CTE? Um, so there are there's some research that's coming out about targeting some of the pro-inflammatory enzymes and blocking them so that the kind of neuroinflammation, which is present, um, is minimalized because neuroinflammation creates damage, okay? And it can be more global. You see, it can start in a local area and it becomes more of a global thing. And that in itself has an effect on the dural membrane because actually a lot of the immune cells of the brain are created in the bones or the dura, in the cranial bones and the dura, which is an interesting thing as well. So vestibular therapy, often you're left with in a long, in a long con uh, concussive, post-concussive um, long concussion with problems with dizziness and a lack of balance. It's a very common symptom. Um, so there are specific balance exercises and gay stabilization to strengthen the often damaged vestibular ocular reflex. Okay. And that's a whole area. Um, there are nowadays, which is a, a very modern because it's just come in, hasn't it? Um, in the, I think it was in the women's world cup, the, the smart mouth guard, mouth guards in world rugby, which monitors these fast acceleration decelerations and flags pay players that need assessment now that doesn't stop them getting hit but it may indicate that someone is 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 coming up to a, a threshold of what they need what was what i'm saying here is actually there is not a lot that people can do about this i mean this is this you know this is this is what they've got you know and it it's a problem okay it really is a problem so just one other aside from concussion uh, as a response to concussion or, or any kind of traumatic bra brain injury, there is the kind of physiological processes of shock with its consequent effects on the, auto on the autonomic nervous system and other systems where the system can go into overwhelm, shutdown, dis dissociation. And there is a, there's often a sense of disassociation when you've had any direct or indirect traumas, um, there is a sense of disassociation. You get a feeling sense that their, their midline has gone awry, gone astray. If they've been hit from one side, say, it feels like their center is over here. And actually, when I'm teaching how to treat any kind of traumatic situation, you have to, have to allow for their midline to return, right? It, without doing that, your treatment is much less effective, okay? You have to look for, and all you do is ask the question, Where's their center? And you don't force it back in. You acknowledge it, right? I used to force it back in with autistic kids. They didn't want to be in there. <laughs> they were quite happy with the stars. So in, all you do is acknowledge it as a practitioner. Where is this person? Why, why is this person beside themselves or whatever? And it's obvious it, when, with these in these situations. So they have to return their center. The brain, according to Sutherland, works on a specific fulcrum, okay, uh, uh, lamina terminalis. So the brain, when it went through its original development, everything is moving towards lamina terminalis in what we would call the inhalation phase. That fulcrum, brain fulcrum, be a set astray with traumatic brain injury, et cetera. So let's come on to what um, cranial osteopaths and CST people where they are particularly, they have a particular method of coming in and actually helping this. And, and I'm completely biased, but I think it's extremely effective. And, it, you know, you can't sort everything out, but, but I spend a lot of my time treating these effects in children, young adults and older. Um, and what we what so just looking at the very simple five phenomena or that Sutherland talked about, which was the the movement of the central nervous system, okay, the movement, the fluid movement of the cranial bones, okay, and the movement of the dura. The dura has a movement which has a fulcrum of motion, the fulcrum of the motion of the dura. So all of these. And then, yeah, the sacrum is fit. So, and the cerebrospinal fluid has the fluctuation as well. So you've got all of these fluctuating, moving 
parts, right? So interestingly, the research, again, is backing up some of these things that he was talking about near, coming up 100 years ago, okay? And talking about actually how the motion of the cerebrospinal fluid programs and could encourage the brain movement itself, yeah? And that's why we're very interested in the fluctuation and the movement of the cerebrospinal fluid. So for example, in a someone who has a post-concussive syndrome, there can be a lack of fluctuation of the cerebrospinal fluid. The, the CSF isn't moving, okay? And it stops, it's just gone shocked, okay? Just by restoring this, this is really important because it bathes the brain, helps the brain in its detoxification, and is also really important in restoring the normal brain detoxification process at night, okay? So there's this whole work that's come out very quite recently about the glymphatic function of the brain, where the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space, when we're in shortwave sleep, comes from the subarachnoid space in towards the fourth, but third, fourth ventricles of the brain. So there's this movement inwards, and then there's this movement outwards, and it's a slow, rhythmic breathing. This is very much what we feel when we're working and when we're doing particular techniques like a CB4, for example. So part of, and when I'm working certainly with autistic children, part of it is very nice to restore this normal fluctuation of the cerebrospinal fluid, okay? Okay, number two, you've got um, dura, the dura. The dura can lock down in response to traumatic shock, right? It, it happens in difficult birth deliveries with babies, yeah? You can have what we would call traumatic membranous inertia, okay? And it can be focal or it can be global, depending on the type and quality of the traumatic injury, which could include birth. But restoring that is really important, actually, because it ha seems to have a direct effect on the freedom of function of the nervous system. So looking specifically at the central nervous system, um, if you're working, for example, with children who have had a different kind of traumatic birth, uh, brain injury from an ischemic, hypoxic um, situation where the blood supply goes, you know, they, they, they don't take the first breath, for example, or there is some problem with the placenta in the delivery and they lose their blood supply and there's this whole, tra there's this whole um, traumatic brain injury that it incurs. When you're working with these children after this, you're working to, you can, when you're feeling this, the, the motion and the motility of the central nervous system, parts of it are not moving, right? And parts of it are damaged beyond repair, sort of beyond repair. But the areas around it feel like they're not moving. They haven't got this freedom of movement. So if we get freedom of movement back, it seems to help in the cellular metabolism and very much in the neuroplasticity, right? So the way that the, the brain can reconnect itself in different ways. I mean, a child's brain, certainly up to the age of four, is, has a huge degree of neuroplasticity, but we still do have some as we get older. When we learn something new, we're employing neuro, neuroplasticity. We're, we're synaptically wiring up a little bit more in a different way in certain parts of the brain, like the... Um, the temporal lobe. So what we want is to get motion, okay? Motion of the CNS, which can help with its restoration of function. And if you think about how the pathophysiology of some of the CTE is there is a lot of um, cellular neuronal destruction, microvasculature issues, and the whole thing becomes inflamed, right? There's an inflammatory process. If you restore some of these basic functions like the cerebrospinal fluid, the dural freedom and the motion with inherent motion, you can help minimalize the effects of accumulative damage, basically. Um, and therein, I think it's terribly important in preventative care actually, because this damage is accumulative, it's unseen, as only it gets to a certain level, 
when they become markers, you know, uh, in certainly in the biochemistry, inflammatory, pro-inflammatory enzymes that can be picked up. And in terms of actually something you can see on a, on a CT scan or an MRI as damage areas. So it's terribly important. The one I forgot to talk about, which is actually quite interesting because this jockey I was treating last week, um, who went through this terrible fall, he was trampled by the horse, he fractured his sphenoid bone. And he um, he's, a, he's a great guy, you know, Irish life, laughing and joking. And he, he, he I brought my children to him. Uh, sorry, the other way around. He brought his children to me. And he's, you know, he's like, whatever you need, just do it. We know that, you know, you're the person to come to, to sort out my hair. And I say to him, you're so, this is amazing. You're so lucky, you know. This, he, he's basically, the, the sphenoid bone had taken the most of the forces and severe forces, right? Fractured, which is a great thing, actually, because actually it's the easiest thing to heal, yeah? Then actually, if you get that trauma through the central nervous system directly, it's much more traumatic for it. OK, so actually the bone took the strain, the bone took the force and the, and the bone intraosseously can heal very nicely. Yeah. And he has no post concussive syndrome at all. You know, absolutely fine on that level. But I'm still treating him because I just want that that fracture pattern to resolve itself. As, and I'm treating some stuff in his arm, you know, whatever. But um, great. So actually, all of these areas are, are quite involved. Um I think that's all I need to say for now. If there's any questions, I don't know how long I've been talking. Anyway. Thanks, Ian. Brilliant. That's cool. wonderful. Yes. So uh, any question? I find this very interesting. I mean, I, I treat a lot of horse riders. Yes. Uh, yeah, right to England. We have a lot. In fact, I saw two today. And very often it feels like what you're saying, that, that this this can persist for years. Yeah. Oh, very much. That kind of cumulative and particularly around inflammation. And I, I, I'm curious, you, you mentioned about inflammation and and I often wonder, well, I can feel it, but I'm not exactly sure where it is. Is it in the fluids? Is it in the memory? You know what I mean? Mm. So you mentioned something. Well, I mean, inflammation can be an inflammatory response can be in any tissue. Yes. Because the, the, you know, the, 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 the whole uh, immune cascade can function in any tissue, actually. Um so very much so but also what you can have is you can have local inflammatory situations but they can program more of a global pro-inflammatory state and say for example you have um uh say a, a classic example is a, a a woman who's kind of peri or postmenopausal um, <clears throat> estrogen levels have dropped off which helps to act to kind of contain an inflammatory state and then you start actually getting these aches and pains become more and more and more because actually the immune system is not so is not kind of te tempered in its way and you start getting these chronic symptoms that can persist for a long period of time the mm -hmm. thing with horse riders of course is they tend to fall on their butt so actually yeah. what i didn't mention of the five phenomenon is the sacrum is locked down and that that lower pole of the sacrum can shift its fulcrum of motion. And if it shifts its fulcrum of motion in a different way, it will have an effect on the, the, the whole tentorium, yeah. the whole dural globe, and yeah. lock it down. And actually, and if you don't resolve the forces that are in the sacrum, and often with nasty forces, you can get intraosseous strains of the sacrum, yeah. um, you, can't, you can't resolve the head end. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, very common. In fact, Sarah's got a question about that. <clears throat> um interested she says interested to hear what, what you feel when you sense your concussion client is healed and ready to play again do you suggest exercises for client as well to support healing especially if they have the pattern of density in their buttocks sacrum and lower back also keen to know how early you recommend starting gentle cranial work after an injury yeah that's an important one um because there is uh, there can be a lot of inflammation right and immediately after an injury but it depends on what you're doing. You know, I suppose my my answer would be as soon as you can, as soon as possible, you know, because the trauma patterns in there, like, right? you know, on the side of the pitch, you know, um, there's, there's a a nice story of of uh, one of my colleagues who's quite a famous osteopath, I won't mention his name, but someone had had, um, had a, on the rugby pitch had had an, an acute, uh, acute concussion and went into seizure pattern and he, he, 
got on there and did uh, Sutherland's resuscitation technique, which is to take everything into external rotation hold, right? Um, and the guy came, obviously came out of the seizure very quickly, you know, so you, you're straight in there. That's, you know, in an ideal world, but you have to be careful because there is, there, there can be some sort of vascular weakness um, and you have to be, I, I suppose you have, but actually what you can do is, is you can start at the sacrum if you feel, you know, but you have to be aware that treating the sacrum has an effect on the other end, you know, but if you can, if you can alleviate some of the physiological effects of shock straight away, yeah, and then you can come back to some of the detail a little bit later, you know, so I mean, personally, but it, you know, you have to, I think you have to have the experience to feel confident to treat stuff that in an acute level. And acute but actually a lot of the time you know the people who wander into the practice are in more in a post-concussive situation where things have accumulated and they've got chronic symptoms or somewhat chronic symptoms and you know that's when they, they really need the help there and you can get in there um as with regards to um exercise it's all for me it's because of these uh because the you know the dural fascial system and this is your area john the dural fascial system is intimately connected you can't really separate them how can you physiologically right the the actually fascial patterns affect the dural and dural patterns of well they are a fascia it's all the same thing right um can affect mm -hmm. each other so anything that will allow for some kind of space and fluid return of like bowen technique of of the, the dural fascial continuum is hugely important. So yes, absolutely. But I always say stretching, please, stretching based yoga, you know? Yeah. Um, you mentioned something I missed about targeting enzymes when you took talking about neuroinflammation. Can you- Oh, that's not, uh, that's not, that, I'm, I'm, that's not me. That's what uh, they're doing in, in the lab at the moment. How do they do that? So they're trying doing, I don't know how they do that. That's, that's, okay. um, that's to, that's that's advanced biochemistry, and I don't know. Basically, <laughs> sounds clever, but I mean, what, I mean, I, I, what I, they're I'm doing not... is they're isolating. Uh, the, I think what they're they're doing is they're they're isolating enzymes which are involved in a pro-inflammatory response and looking at how to target them with medication. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. No, I'm asking this really because it, it's something I've seen a, a lot of in practice, and it and it's quite tricky to work with. I I, I feel. And it, and it creates havoc in the body. I mean, really, in all kinds of the, all the systems of the body. I mean, I I I gave a course last weekend, the weekend no, ten days ago, on uh, perception in the neuroendocrine system, and just talking. I mean, it's a huge subject because inflammation actually is involved in most of what we see in clinic, most of what of what people see in hospital from cancer to cardiovascular disease to you know inflammation on some level is massive it's and it's hugely increased i think you know um for a variety of kind of trigger pro-inflammatory reasons and environmental toxicity etc yeah. um you know so actually inflammation you know you could spend a whole well i'd have to spend a whole weekend talking about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Great. And um, if there are any other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, this thing, you, again, you, you mentioned it earlier about if women have a concussion at a certain point in the cycle. Could you talk more about that? I didn't quite yeah, understand. That's, that's that. research. I, I, I mean, I don't know, um, but it, it's widely known that women have will certainly present with more symptoms of concussion than men do. And which you would think it would be the opposite way round, because more men are out banging their heads against the walls, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, and and they're trying to put it down to possibly a, a change in, in progesterone, depending on what stage in the cycle. I think basically people don't know. I personally, in my, I can only go from my own personal experience. In my own personal experience, I, I tend to treat more males with concussions personally but yeah. that's interesting that's that's yeah um mm. and and I, I know you do a lot of pediatric work so you're seeing this with babies right so babies for well, example if, yes been... it's not i mean it's if you if you've gone through a traumatic 
delivery. There are a lot of forces that are involved. Okay. And so you have you can have direct trauma. It's not doesn't necessarily have to be violent. They've not bashed at the floor as they've come out, whatever, but they have a, obviously a lot of compressive forces and a lot of recoil forces yeah. that go through. It's the, you know, it's it's the it's the hardest thing that your head or body might have to go through in life. Yeah. <laughs> Is the, is the is the birth process and it affects all of these systems in different ways depending on the force the direction the force the um and also the degree of potential shock that's involved so actually yeah. of course if this work is you know one of the most important things is working with babies and just to release these forces let everything come back to this nice fluid medium which they are but again babies are extremely well adapted to coping with these levels of forces you know um it's only I, when go on. I suppose you're seeing that possibly more i see it more in for example in in babies who've been through an induction process yes. where everything is faster and harder and absolutely you know. but very much so yeah uh, you know you have an induction you're not fully dilated yeah uh because the guy only wants to go home play golf and they you know so you, you're pounding the vault of the head or whatever part that presents the, the the brow or wherever onto a contracted cervix okay and you're then the force of the contractions grinding the head into that are massive and then you know of course if you if you apply a vontus which has a strong effect on the dural membrane yeah forceps which which can which affects the bones often a lot more um you know these are a lot of forces but the baby is very well adapted they tend to unravel most of these molding forces quite nicely it's just when they get stuck that that we have to come in and release them which is a beautiful thing to do in my in yeah my uh, i suppose except that things like von Tuse, apart from the local force uh, uh, applied uh, is also incredibly strong tractional kind of forces it is really it is. the you know things like the you know the suboxabil muscles they're not really designed for that kind of thing right no and one thing for, if there's any craniosacral therapists out there which is i think is quite important um and i always i always mention this if you're treating kids who've had von tus okay when we treat we tend to treat towards the inhalation phase right you tend to get everything to open right now if you have a von tus that's, that's been applied to the often to the occiput yeah, yeah. <clears throat> what that does number one apart from what you've already said it, what it does is it will shift the sutherland fulcrum right which is normally at the meeting of the falx and tent right posteriorly right so what happens is is if is you you're treating the other strains in, in the body and everything's going into this nice inhalation phase flexion right and this fulcrum of the von Tuss is still two inches behind where it should be right you're gonna you're gonna make them irritable. <laughs> they they're the kids are gonna go crazy because they're you're decompensating them. Yeah. Mm. And that's huge. That's very important also in children, babies who've had tongue tie releases. Yeah, you have to get you have to treat them before they get the tongue tie, the the uh, to, uh, frenial and ectomy, because the fulcrums of the dura are very strong. The dura is extremely strong and everything else. And actually, if they've got a fulcrum out here and you release the anterior, the tongue tie, it can decompensate their whole system. And, you know, what our local pediatrician calls, you know, the kind of nightmare cases almost. But that's, there's a very clear reason why, you know. Um, so actually, yes, that's a whole <laughs> subject, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amanda's got a question here. She works with children in rugby development. Uh, if players who have suffered repeated impact and concussions were to receive craniosacral therapy osteopathy, would it alleviate long-term damage? Well, I think the answer is that would be. I mean that that is what I would be infer inferring. And what we need to do actually is to, in a in a perfect ideal world, we need a bunch of osteopaths or CSD people. Doesn't matter both, right? Working with a control group of kids who work in well, uh, who are high level rugby playing kids, right? And you follow them, you treat them once a month or whatever, once every six weeks, all the way through their childhood. And you get the other group, the, the, the non-control who aren't treated and see what their, their symptomatic outcomes. That would be the perfect bit of research, but that takes a huge amount of time, money, et cetera, et cetera. But what I am inferring from this is very much so, actually very much so. It should be, and in a, in a perfect world, you know, you have your physio, 
you and you have your cranial person, right? Because it's really important, especially in impact sports, rugby, horse riding, hurling, soccer, etc. Yeah, absolutely vital. I would say, but I'm biased. But I would say that that's an experiential thing. I would agree with you absolutely, hundred <clears throat> percent. Um, right, I think we're nearly done, aren't we? There's um, there was a question from Jan, but I can't see it now. It's gone. Great. Cool. Any last questions for Ian before we stop? Uh, Jan's just asking, think of a baby. Thinking of babies, could this affect breastfeeding? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is, I mean, <laughs> that, that's a massive subject. Could, could, could a difficult birth affect breastfeeding? That, that, I mean, I could, you could give a whole, we could talk for an hour on that because there are so many different factors involved in, in the the lactation process but very much so because um of yes for, um very much so like for example it can affect the the, the function of the pituitary uh, and prolactin function it can and, and obviously shock and trauma really are very important in an establishment of the oxytocin bonding letdown response and um it's very important to 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 get on an ideal world as well. I used to to, to um, teach osteopaths with a, a, an American obstetrician who was a cranial osteopath at the same time. So she would treat them as they as as she delivered them. That's the perfect solution. Yeah, and and uh, you know, and actually, so yeah, teaching midwives this yeah. is as you're doing is a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I did, a, I did a talk on this on our birth journey, Jan. If you want to have a look at that, a whole thing about about breastfeeding and this. Okay, one last question, if that's all right, Ian. Uh, can yep. being tongue tied be a symptom of unresolved forces in the dura or other? Can symptoms? what? Can being tongue tied be a oh. symptom of unresolved forces in the dura or other symptoms that express in the throat area? Okay, I mean, there's two things here. Uh, again, we're way off track, but. Where often when there is a, a tongue tie happens quite early in development, right? When the frenulum doesn't free up. So it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental developmental issue. Okay. And it's possibly linked um, to uh, possibly linked to some sort of folic acid uptake insufficiency. Um, and it can link up with gastroesophageal reflux. Um, but what happens in a, in a, tongue tie or a lip tie and lung, uh, tongue and lip tie is that obviously the tongue is tied down in the face so you can't you go through the normal tongue function now there can be often some of the the myofascial connections of the tongue right that go down into the jaw down um onto the hyoid and down across into the the, the shoulder okay the all the particular kind of hyoid um milo milohyoidoma hyoid etc cetera, etc cetera, muscles um and fascial drags for example if, if you have a, a slight shoulder dystocia um and the shoulder is dragged it can affect okay um the omohyoid and you can actually get some um you can get a drag onto the root of the tongue Right, which accentuates the, the 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 feeding difficulty. So they don't; it doesn't cause it, but it can make it a lot worse. For example, if you don't have an extreme tongue tie and it's a minor posterior tongue tie, yeah. If you resolve the rest of the forces in the face and the mechanics of the face and the mechanics of the shoulders and the whole of that in the cranium, um, you may not need to have the tongue tie treated. It, you, you you can get rid of the feeding difficulties. That's about. That's about 20 seconds on uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank, thanks. That's really interesting about the shoulder. Um, and also, yeah, we have, we've had a series with a a Alison Hazelbecker um, uh, on this, on tongue tie as well. She's, she's very good on that. I don't know if you come across her work. Have you, Ian? She's, she's a real, real uh, powerhouse. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ian. That was really brilliant. Great. And, um yeah they'll put i think can we put up my details on my website um yes. stillness.com is my website um and yeah if you've got any questions just send me an email right so dynamic <laughs> the, no uh, dynamics of stillness oh, oh, dynamics oh. of stillness.com is the website and i've got online courses and all sorts of stuff and where i'm teaching and um and 
Dyn dynamics of stillness at gmail.com is the um is the email. Okay. Perfect. Brilliant. Dynamics of stillness at gmail.com. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ian. That was really oh, brilliant. Nice Thanks to talk to you. All right. Take care. Thanks Bye. everybody. Bye.